Yes, I would like to thank Mark and the organizers as well for this uh, invitation. It's been quite a trip from Miami, but certainly worth the effort. And uh, yeah, I've, I'm in the session called Synapto Projectome, so I couldn't resist to uh, rename my talk into Exoprojectome, just uh, uh, to make it sound cooler. Um, <laughs> and uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our approach, how we try to uh, map connectivity to uh, reconstruct anatomically realistic circuits in a very special system, the, the bristle or the, the whisker system in rats. And uh, so we just focus on one animal and then on one model and try to get as much data, physiological, behavioral data, anatomical data from the same system so that we try, uh, the, so that we can understand at least this simple system from the subserial level, um, maybe up to the behavioral consequences of these uh, microcircuits. So for those who are not familiar with the whisker system, just very briefly, um, the nice uh, thing about the whisker system is that there's a nice uh, functional and anatomical uh, correspondence between a single fa facial whisker on the animal's snout and uh, segregated areas in the cortex which are called barrel columns. So the only thing at this point you need to know is that there's a network of about 18 to 20,000 neurons in the cortex that processes the information that is uh, obtained by this single whisker and the, uh, how these uh, uh, columns are arranged resembles how these whiskers are arranged. So neighboring columns process information from neighboring whiskers. So this would be a top view on the cortical surface of it and if you turn it around by 90 degrees to a thalamocortical view it resembles a cylinder or yeah, more or less a cylinder and therefore it's called a cortical column. And, uh, but from this cartoonish version, what we are interested in, uh, interested in is, uh, as I said, an uh, anatomically realistic model. So what you see here is the thalamocortical uh, view of uh, the red brain. And uh, the colors you see here in red, uh, we stained all neuron somata. And in green, we stained uh, for gut 67, which is uh, located in inhibitory synapses and in inhibitory somata. So basically, wherever you see a red spherical structure is a neuron somata and if you see it in red and green it's an inhibitory neuron somata uh, neuron soma so up here where there is more green uh, this would be the uh, sensory cortex and you might say okay I don't see any columns what is he talking about um, so if you really count every neuron um, in this area and label with a landmark and uh, convert it to a 3D density distribution, you end up with this picture. So this would be from multiple uh, of these large brain sections, uh, the three-dimensional density distribution um, of all neurons in this area. And you can see that there is structure. So this would be one column here, second column, third column. And if you turn this around in 3D, you end up with the entire barrel field. And so what we are interested in now is uh, how is such a cortical column activate, activated when a whisker is deflected? What happens if the animal is uh, whisking and exploring its environment? What is happening in the circuit uh, and what does it do? As all cortices, the cortical column gets an input from the thalamus, which would be down here. So we started reconstructing uh, the thalamocortical network. So if we zoom in here, you see that there is something that looks like this barrel pattern we see in cortex, but now in thalamus. And it's basically the same story. Each of these kind of uh, ovoids uh, processes the information from a related whisker and relays this as input signals to a cortical column, to the corresponding cortical column. So we started reconstructing these excitatory neurons because we know from functional data. So what we also do, I should mention, we first uh, measure the physiological response of each neuron in the living animal and then we fill it, stain it and reconstruct it. So we know how this particular neuron res re uh, responses to the deflection of a whisker and uh, then we want to know its anatomy and where it's placed in uh, the network. So what you see here in dark blue would be the dendrite, uh, uh, the dendrite of the cell, and in light blue the exon. And you see that the exon starts already branching here in this area where there is more green. And as I said, green indicates that there are inhibitory interneurons. And if we zoom even uh, in more and start reconstructing these inhibitory interneurons, 
here in red the dendrites, in light red the exon, we see that there's a direct feedback loop from this inhibitory neuron to this uh, excitatory neuron and thalamus. So this, what this already tells us is upon whisker deflection, this neuron is activating the cortex, but also activating this inhibitory neurons in thalamus, which project back and shut off these excitatory neurons. So this is kind of a, a, a switch with, which uh, 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 governs the timing and synchrony of the uh, input into the cortex. This is already something the anatomy tells us about the function uh, of this particular circuit. And if we zoom out again and follow this axon all the way up through the white matter into the, cortex, into the cortex, we see that it starts branching in cortex, in somatosensory cortex, heavily again. And that there, this axon distribution looks already like a, like a column. So if we zoom in again now on the cortex, the projections from the thalamus define basically the vertical extents of a cortical column. This would be, so the order of magnitude we're talking about here is uh, about six centimeters of exon from a single uh, neuron uh, that is distributed here. And as I also said, these, uh, this exon potentially targets about 18,000 neurons in cortex. So the next question is, what kinds of neurons do we find in cortex and how many connections do these different types make with this type of thalamocortical neurons? Uh, yeah, so what we do is reconstruct neurons in cortex. So we basically go at every depth uh, in cortex with our electro, record the activity of individual neurons from up here to down here. This would be the PS surface down here, the white matter, and uh, look at their physiology and their anatomy. And then we reconstruct, this would be top view of the brain, this, this thalamocortical view, and then we find, for instance, this subtype of neurons, well-known layer 5 thick tufted neurons, um, but we also find different types, like these layer 2 pyramidal neurons, which are located up here, and if we do this for all kinds of neurons at all depth, we end up with nine different types of excitatory neurons uh, that are located within the cortical column, and you see there's uh, overlap between some uh, types uh, but there are also uh, areas where you only find specific uh, neuron types. So as I said, we are also interested in connectivity, so the first step uh, to do is reconstruct not only one of these thalamocortical axons, but many. So what you see here are 25 of these thalamocortical axons superimposed, and uh, you see a very stereotypic innervation pattern for these neurons. They all define the column. They have all densest arborization up here in layer four, some dense arborization up here, and they stop at the border at, of layer two, three. So in the next step, we can superimpose these axons uh, with the dendritic reconstructions in 3D, and as a first order estimate of connectivity, we just calculate how much uh, uh, each neuron is uh, contributing in space uh, in terms of dendrite and how much exon is there, and just get a first order approximation um, of connectivity between the thalamus and each individual neuron in cortex in a type specific manner. And then we can come up with these kind of three-dimensional type-specific density distributions of synapses. So, as I said, the axon stops here, so layer two neurons won't get that much input, but uh, the thick tufted neurons get a, get a lot of input, and we already get some information on the subcellular uh, level, so we see that most input for these neuron type is uh, to be expected in their basal uh, dendrites and here in the apical trunk in layer four, but not much much up here, and this would be just 3D distribution of all thalamocortical synapses in a cortical column. But this is just the input to the cortex, so the next, next question, of course, would be, so what happens in the type-specific way with this input? Do these different dendritic neuron types also have different exon types? Do they target specific um, uh, other distributions? And this is actually true, so we started on reconstructing the intracortical projections from these uh, layer thick tuft, five thick tufted neurons, for instance. They have this very stereotypic axon pattern as well. Uh, they project locally within the column to all layers, but uh, spread laterally quite uh, over a few uh, adjacent columns, uh, but only in deep layers. And if you look at a different cell type, we found a uh, completely different axon pattern in cortex, where you can see that the concept of a cortical column 
is maybe justified in terms of input, but not in terms of intracortical computing. So this is one cell that has about 10 centimeters of exon within cor just within cortex, involves many different columns. So on average, 12 different columns are innervated by a single neuron, and it even innervates surrounding cortical areas, so it doesn't even stick to the barrel field. And we've done many of these and superimposed them, and you, as I said, these are very stereotypic. So you see that this certain cell type uh, has, involves many cortical columns and these kind of, which are called so-called discranular zones. And this other cell type is more locally and stays within the cortical column. But as I said, we do 3D reconstruction and it's very important to look at all these reconstructions in 3D because you not only see um, kind of s structure on the tangential view, but also in this. So this neuron type stays within the column boundaries in these deeper layers, but spreads in the upper layers. So this indicates that uh, these neurons basically target layer two neurons in the surrounding columns, but for instance, only layer five neurons in the local column. And for this neuron type, it's the opposite way. So it, this is targeting broad, uh, wider or, or spreading wider and deeper layers, but staying within the column boundaries in the upper layers. So these are two neuron types that basically see the same input. Of course, they're located at the same spot, but they have completely different dendrite projections, function, exon projections. So this uh, is kind of the picture again, just for reference, because I, my talk is uh, called, it gives the anatomy already gives you an insight into the dynamics uh, of this. So this would be, think of it, the whisker is deflected, the, this neuron or these neurons here are excited, give excitation to the cortex, are sh immediately shut, up, shut off, so it's a synchronous volley of activity that's coming into the cortex, and then there are nine different cell types that are activated and uh, integrate into different cortices. And it already tells us something or it helps us to interpret uh, on, a, on a much larger scale uh, our functional picture what is happening in cortical processing. So this is uh, stuff we did a few years ago uh, uh, with voltage sensitive dye imaging. So what is done here is uh, we deflected a single whisker and looked at uh, the spread of excitation on the cortical surface and this number is the uh, milliseconds after the whisker deflection. So this is 60 milliseconds after the whisker deflection and you see if you compare it to the distribution of thalamocortical exon, this pretty nicely matches. And since we record from each neuron, we reconstruct, we also know the latency uh, of these neurons and this pretty nicely matches as well. So these neurons in uh, thalamus are activated about 10 milliseconds after the whisker deflection, have exon patterns that stick to the cortical column and activate therefore only the cortical column. But if we look a bit later, 26 milliseconds we are, uh, after the whisker deflection, we already see a spread to the adjacent areas, but the peak activity stays still within the cortical column. And if we compare this with the exon projection pattern of the thick tufted neurons in layer five and with their latency, this pretty much matches as well. So this already tells us that large fraction of this picture we see here is due to the excitation of layer five thick tufted neurons and not any other neuron type. And if you go further in time and look at 50 milliseconds, we see that there's a, quite a large spread of excitation into many adjacent columns and out of the, uh, the bristle cortex. And again, if we now compare that with the latency of these slender tested exons and with their exon distributions, this pretty nicely matches as well. So we gain some insight that at different points in time, different circuits in the cortex are active. And from these exon reconstructions, we know now which circuits are involved at which point in time. But what is even more interesting is that these different neuron types also respond differently in terms of behavioral state. So what I've been talking about so far is only happening during whisker touch. So where the animal is anesthetized and we deflect the whisker and look uh, what is happening. But and there you see that these thick tufted neurons are active, whereas these slender tufted neurons are completely inactive. But now if the animal is awake, and we did all the same stuff in terms of physiology in awake animals, um, we see that the picture is inverted. So these slender tufted neurons 
um, show most activity where the thick tufted neurons are close to baseline. This already tells us that these different intracortical circuits also are involved in distinct behavioral uh, paradigms. So this already gives us some idea what these neurons might do. So we see that this neuron is primarily active when the animal is exploring and actively whisking and is spreading across the entire vibrissal cortex. So this suggests that this neuron type is involved in coordinating the movement between individual whiskers. This neuron type is basically involved in decoding or encoding the touch of a whisker, is very fast, shows is not involved extensively in intracortical processing, so it's basically just generating an output signal upon whisker touch. And this is very important for rats because they rely on, on their whisker information and they can make very fast decision upon a single touch. So a rat can touch an object and make within 100 to 200 milliseconds decisions based on the single whisker touch. So th this cell type seems to be responsible or involved in this uh, fast decision making, whereas this cell type with long latencies seems to be involved in higher function of uh, coordinating whiskers or even coordinating whiskers with eye movement, head position, um, which is suggested by their projections to these discranular zones. And since we've seen so many nice videos today, I wanted to contribute a video as well. Uh, just stop here. So what you see here, so the purpose of all this, uh, this anatomical work and recording the function and the different behavioral states is that we really try to understand behavior at the subcellular level. So what is happening in, at synapses during the whisker touch of different cell types. And what we've done so far is that we take all the anatomical data we have and put them into an anatomically realistic model. So we have, on the left hand side, you see uh, 18,000 neurons that are distributed in space as we counted them and measured them. Each neuron is a full three-dimensional a three-dimensional compartmental model from reconstructed neurons of this type we identified. Each neuron has an individual distribution of synapses or thalamocortical synapses based on the statistical overlap between these thalamocortical axons and we give them input that we measured in vivo and don't do a lot of fancy uh, stuff so we just activate, ev treat every neuron in terms of its uh, ion channel distributions etc. the same so, and give all the neurons the same uh, input and then we can observe what kind of uh, postsynaptic potential distribution but also what kind of spiking do we get. So on the left hand side you see how this, the whisker deflection is activating the co cortical column in terms of PSPs and uh, on the right hand side you see the uh, AP distribution within a cortical column. And the nice thing is that uh, This, on the right hand side, is basically exactly what we measured. So, by measuring the spiking rates of different of these neuron types, we come up with numbers how many uh, neurons would spike in layer 4, how many neurons would spike here, how many neurons would spike here. And just based on this anatomically constrained model with not many fancy physiology uh, in it, we get correlation values this morning someone asked about correlation values. We get a correlation from this simulation to our measured data of 0.9 already. So this is very close correlation. So it seems that the passive deflection of a whisker in a anesthetized animal uh, and its cell type specific response in the cortical column is just determined by the thalamocortical input and doesn't involve much intracortical processing. This is preliminary so um, okay with this I'm more or less done and I would uh, uh, point out two things first of all we moved to Florida to a new Max Planck Institute this is uh, how it will look like in a couple of years so it's not that fancy uh, right, right now so everybody who's uh, in Florida and wants to visit us is very welcome 
Um, the next thing I would point out, so if you're curious about the stuff we're doing, uh, and here on Thursday, uh, Bert Sackmann will give a talk uh, in much more detail uh, about the stuff we are doing. So it's in the very same building here uh, on Thursday on this Neuro 2010 meeting. And then I would like to acknowledge uh, the students in our lab uh, who did this. So Tatiana Kleele was uh, involved in these nice layer 5 exon reconstructions. Mike Hamburger is doing an excellent job in this inhibitory interneurons. And then my long-term collaborators, Christian de Kock and uh, his student Simbo Baudewein at the uh, VU in Amsterdam, um, who I'm doing all the intracortical uh, projections and the physiology with Randy, Bu Randy Bruno and his uh, student Alejandro Ramirez at Columbia University, who I'm doing all these thalamocortical uh, uh, innovation with Vincent Dergson in Berlin, uh, who's helping us uh, uh, on the method development. I didn't talk about method, but all the stuff is done with custom-made methods we just did for these purposes. And Stefan Lang at the Institute for Scientific Computing in Heidelberg, um, who developed this uh, nice uh, 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 simulation environment th that allows us to do these large-scale models of the cortical column and even more. Thanks. So this nice talk is open for questions and uh, so just uh, you make these kind of uh, Peters like uh, statistical approximation and there's this very good agreement with your simulations and the measured data so do you think of that yeah as, as I said so it's the it's statistical a, approximation it, doesn't do too badly yeah, it's a first order approximation and it's for one connection type. So it's uh, uh, only for these uh, thalamocortical uh, uh, projection. And uh, you have to, have to admit, so what I, I was stating here about the correlation is the spike rate. So it's the number of spikes we see within 20 milliseconds. So um, another correlation that we see is the variability in, in spiking. But it's certainly not predicting the exact timing of spikes, etc. So there's much more, of course, going on there. So it's a, it's a very kind of simple first order uh, measurement we do. We are certainly interested in more realistic and we have the data on the exact spike timing and, uh, uh, and even more. Um, so this is uh, the aim why we want to simulate this. So we really want to, you know, run hundreds of simulations and try what kind of functional connectivity parameter, because this is structural connectivity at the first order. But what we're really after is the functional connectivity between these types by simulating and tuning the models in terms of functional connectivity until we observe what we really measured exactly in the living animal. So this is kind of the first or the starting point for connectivity mapping. So, uh, very elegant, thanks a lot. A uh, uh, physiological question. The layer 5 cells that you had during activity, uh, uh, there you should be able to, to discriminate between those projecting directly to stratum and those projecting uh, to uh, salamus and, uh, yeah. and pontine. So, did you have activation of both types? Or? Yeah, so um, these. Uh, Slender tufted neurons I was talking about, these are the striatum projectum neurons. Um, these are the ones that have this uh, massive intracortical. So there's a lot of uh, uh, different annotations for these neuron types. So what we call slender tufted neurons are the striatum projectum neurons, and the thick tufted neurons are the ones that project to pons and PUM, etc. And uh, uh, the one that projected striatum have this massive intracortical projection pattern are the ones that respond to active whisking and have long latencies and the thick tufted ones are the ones that are subcortical targets uh, uh, and uh, have less intracortical projections. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, in the visual system there's good reason to think that sort of cell to cell um, connectivity at the level of the synapse could be specific by function. And so maybe we can't understand it um, by doing this kind of overlaps of dendritic and axonal fields. And I'm, 
is the work that you're showing here, do you think it's necessary and sufficient to kind of completely understand the dynamics and, and the processing that the system's doing in the barrel cortex? Or do you think that um, this kind of specificity that we think may be in the, visual, in the visual cortex also will be found in barrel? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is uh, uh, up to speculation, I guess. Um, yeah, well, we don't, we don't really know. The thing that strikes us is that even such a very first attempt gives us some insights uh, and reproduces data we measure in the, in the living animal. If this is uh, oversimplification or whatever, I cannot really say. Um, I think what it really comes down to is uh, that you thoroughly classify what is a, is, is a cell type and uh, how you sp define specificity of a certain cell type. So we, uh, what I didn't uh, mention here is these cell types, we just classify them by their dendrites and their location within the network. But what we also found that they have different uh, physiological properties. So it's not that, so if you would do the same classification on the same data set, uh, on physiological data or even on exon distributions, you would come up with exactly the same uh, neuron type. And the nice thing about the barrel system is that there is a rather well-defined separation between some cell types which you probably won't have in visual cortex, whether it's a bigger mess, so to speak. Um, so I, it's another reason why we prefer, prefer the barrel system because it's a bit more well-structured. Okay, I think we can move on if there are no other questions and continue this in the panel discussion and then over beer. So thank you again, Marcel.